In this podcast, we'll take you on a journey where you will discover that at the junction of tech and copyright, while we are living in a digital age with unlimited potential, many walls have come up, making it more difficult for users and creators to access, share, and reuse what is available online and offline. This journey will take many stops, interviewing a variety of people ranging from internet entrepreneurs to librarians and publishing professionals, from digital rights activists to sci-fi writers, and we ask them how copyright and tech affect their daily lives. In this episode, our guest is Jenny Rose Halperin. Um, Jenny is a writer and a digital strategist, and she's trained as a librarian, but and she currently serves as the executive director of uh, Library Futures, which is a nonprofit organization that champions equitable access to knowledge. Um, before, from 19 till 20, she worked as the assistant director of outreach and engagement at the Harvard Law Library. And before that, and that is actually where I, uh, where I uh, had the pleasure of working together with Jenny, is uh, she was a senior communications manager at Creative Commons. Um, and even uh, before that, she dipped into digital publishing as a product engagement manager for Safari Books Online and O'Reilly Media. And she also served as a community manager at Mozilla. So welcome, Jenny. Thanks so much, Gwen. It's so good to to see you and to hear from you. It's lovely to lovely to meet you again. So um, let's talk about your uh, current position, Jenny. Um, you are the executive director of Library Futures, which is an organization that champions a technology positive future for libraries. Um, you empower libraries to embrace the digital, ensuring access to knowledge for all. Um, we, we've, we've encountered this before in this podcast series that libraries are often hindered by copyright instead of empowered. Um, especially when trying to fulfill their public mission. Can you tell us a bit more about co what copyright issues libraries face and how uh, your organization, Library Futures, is helping them to uh, tackle these challenges? Yeah, so thank you for this question. I first want to say that li librarians and, and people who work in libraries probably touch copyright more than any other profession. So, you know, whether it's lending a book or, or a piece of material or teaching a patron about their, their rights under copyright, um, more librarians work within the systems of rights and limitations than really any other profession and particularly any other knowledge profession. And I think there's sort of a perception sometimes that, well, copyright is over. No one cares about copyright anymore. People are just using things on the internet. But any librarian, particularly any librarian who has faced any kind of issue with copyright will tell you that, no, 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 copyright is quite important. And also it's something that one has to know and respect when, um, you know, providing information to the public. And we're lucky in the United States to have a relatively flexible copyright regime, although I know that's not universal and I know that's not global. Publishers are creating previously unrecognizable contractual agreements with libraries that are, frankly, pretty legally incomprehensible. So we're seeing issues where uh, libraries can only lend books 26 times before they disappear from their libraries. And we're seeing issues where, you know, publishers are just not making materials available. I saw a recent um, report from Ireland where the price of ebooks have gone up 400% in the last few years. So we find, as an organization, we find these kinds of licensing agreements necessarily exploitative. And so the way I sometimes describe it is, you know, the limitations placed on contractual agreements for streaming services and for digital services are, are very bad for the public, but they're, they're a disaster for the public sector. So what we're seeing is this locking down of culture and this locking down of knowledge. And I would say that this is, this is a copyright issue for sure, but it's also another kind of legal issue, which is a, a, contra a contractual issue. Uh, an issue with the creation of contracts that are legally permissible, but maybe not legally comprehensible. And so when we get to talk, like, talking a little bit about the state legislation that the United States, that we're working on in the United States, I do uh, want to make sure that we're talking about it from a contractual point of view rather than from a copyright point of view. And then last, I just want to say that, you know, we've really seen the Copyright Office, which is in the Library of Congress in the United States, uh, take a much more sort of active role in some of these copyright debates. 
And so in, at least in the United States, you know, we're seeing issues like the case act, which could potentially open up librarians who are just doing their jobs by photocopying materials or by providing materials to their patrons, it could possibly see them involved in active litigation through these sort of secret tribunals that could charge them up to $20,000 for an infringement. So I don't frankly often see uh, the copyright landscape uh, getting better, but I do think that through our advocacy, through our work on legislation, through our uh, work with other organizations that are, you know, interested in promoting really balanced copyright and rights. I do think that we can move the needle forward and also promote what we call a technology positive future for libraries, which is not necessarily something that, um, a lot of other organizations are working on because I really see libraries as being indicative of this entire question of public access that includes government and universities and education and schools and is an all-encompassing view of what, of what can it really look like if we promote a balanced digital ecosystem and balanced digital rights that work for everyone, not just uh, rights holders, and that works for artists and that works for writers and that works for uh, and that works for the public. Hey, thanks. So um, we, you've already touched the, 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 the touchy subject of ebooks and, and libraries. And, and um, maybe we were wondering, because it's a topic that often comes up with, with when you talk about libra with, with libraries in this podcast series, maybe you could tell us also a little bit more about ebooks could like complement the traditional offer in, in, a, in a modern library, but also maybe for people who don't know it, because like I've never lent an ebook from a library, um, like how does controlled digital lending works and, and what are potential issues that arise there. You've already touched some in the in the previous question, but maybe you can go into more detail. Yeah, so I just want to make it clear that there's really no reason why ebooks should be touchy. They're touchy because the publishers have made them touchy. It could just be a shifting format question, right? So the vast majority of human knowledge is contained in books. And when those books are not available to the public, everyone suffers. So Controlled digital lending is an emerging practice that lends print books in what's called an owned to loan ratio. So controlled digital lending can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different libraries. It's being explored by vendors and companies. It's being explored in working groups. It's a very popular within libraries. And it's it's not necessarily setting out to replace the way that people lend ebooks now, it relies on some sort of rights management. Uh, many places use uh, Adobe Digital Editions or they use um, another form of rights management system. It can be clunky, it can take time, but what it really is doing is supporting libraries in their aims of preservation, supporting libraries in their aims of access, and supporting libraries in their aims of, frankly, respecting copyright. I mean, if you uh, if you think of an ebook as more of a shifting file format or a shifting format, um, then it becomes a, a a bigger question of why shouldn't a library be able to scan a book much like they always have, and then provide it much like they would to the public, assuming that the public cannot also take out the physical book at the same time. So it's a ratio, it respects copyright, and it's what libraries have always done and what they should be doing. And I really think that the upswell of interest and the upswell of um, work that's been done by the library community in this is really is really indicative of that. I mean, IFLA recently, I think, well, not that recently, so in June, put out a statement uh, supporting controlled digital lending and there is a national information standards group here in the United States that is working on creating standards for controlled digital lending. So it's it's coming, it's happening. And I think all of us are interested in how we can do it more equitably, more efficiently, and also use the existing systems like the, the Internet Archives Open Library system, um, to some extent, a library like Hottie Trust, which doesn't exactly do controlled digital lending, but does lend out materials in an own-to-loan fashion. Um, 
and really exploring the possibilities of this technology as a way to improve access. And I, I'd really recommend that if you're listening to this podcast, you take a look at our policy paper on how controlled digital lending can promote uh, equal rights and can promote uh, better print accessibility and the sort of the the very many things that we can um, support with controlled digital lending. Uh, related, but not the same. Um, and maybe because they become more and more popular as well as like, does the same what you say about ebooks is also applicable for audiobooks, or do you think that's an entirely different discussion? Because of, of, after all, it's also this, it's a different carrier, but it's the same content. So yeah. oof, that's a good question. So <laughs> I, you know, audiobooks are different uh, and have, you know, different rules and different rights and different regulations yeah. and limitations, exceptions. Uh, and most of the work that is being done on CDL right now is around print materials. However, CDL can be used for sort of time-based materials mm -hmm. and that can and should be explored. Uh, but I think that at least within the working groups that I'm working with, people are mostly exploring print-based materials. Um, however, you know, audiobooks should be treated as they are under copyright as a, yeah. as a performance more so than uh, than, than a a piece of print material. Yeah. So that's a yes and. Yes, they will they should be considered under CDL. There are ways there's there's actually a great mm -hmm. uh, academic paper that I can I can send to you to put in the resources about mm -hmm. using CDL for for media and uh Kathleen D. Laurenti at Johns Hopkins has also been exploring using controlled digital lending uh for scores, for musical scores, uh which is really interesting mm -hmm. and also for um uh for for streaming resources we also did a um a recent webinar uh with um rick prellinger kathleen who i mentioned and courtney cook and chris paulson all of whom are in the academic space and and work with streaming media courtney in particular works for point of view which is public media and she talked about how they take a, a very different approach in terms of distribution, but there's still a lot of work to be done there. And I, for one, am excited about digging into it. Okay, thanks. Yeah, don't forget to send us uh, the links. We'll add them to the documentation for this Absolutely. podcast. Absolutely. Um, so before closing the subject, like like just your thoughts in general. So the opposition by publishers against this, all these trends and the, 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 these new developments, like why is it and do you think do you think you will you will find a way to work with them or do you think it's just going to get worse so we've, we've had different opinions on this on this on this podcast before uh, we had the optimistic view and a pessimistic view so, so. I, I tend to be pretty optimistic um you know i i also want to, want to say not all publishers are publishers are not a monolith mm -hmm. and just much much like librarians are not a monolith <laughs> there's no like great community of publishers um, and I usually prefer the term entrenched rights holders. Um, but, you know, at least in the, again, at least in the United States, like big public to say something is big publishing is, is really an understatement. We're in this situation in which the majority of print based publishing has been consolidated into four, four to five large companies. And the advances paid by these companies are so far outstrip the, um, you know, any other kinds of advances. And most independent publishers just want to get their books into libraries. Like, is it CDL? Is it contracts? Like, they just want to get the best deal for their, um, for their authors. And so, you know, I think it's really important to also remember that publishers and libraries have effectively different aims and to treat either as a purely transactional um, relationship is not um, is clearly not not serving anyone. But um, so you know, I'm I'm not I'm not going to like demonize <laughs> all publishers at all. But I, I do think that there needs to be a, a greater level of creativity, and I think that there needs to be a greater level of acceptance. Publishers throughout time have opposed. Um, technological in innovations that have ultimately served them. I mean, 
Napster, for example, completely changed the way that people access music and publishers were absolutely opposed to it, not even willing to consider, you know, how this could play into um, a more balanced landscape. And, you know, the the tool of uh, litigation, the tool of chilling effects, these are serious and it really just serves as a distraction from our ultimate goal which is for libraries to get the best, most equitable, ideal access to materials for the public. For publishers, they're, they're concerned about their, their bottom line. And I, I, I don't think that those two goals necessarily need to be in opposition, but I think that the way that it plays out, particularly within a landscape that is consolidating, where our greatest media content um, companies are, you know, behaving more like data brokers or like data companies rather than publishers. I think that's a scary landscape. And I think it's something that we as a library and public interest technology and public interest copyright community really need to address. And that's what we're hoping to do. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for making a, for making already a little bridge to the music industry because uh, yeah. my next question is actually about a, a recent tweet of yours that caught our eyes at, at World Culture. Uh, it's actually about the Rogan Spotify fiasco, and what what you're saying is um, the bundling of licenses in a rent based model means that the Rogan Spotify fiasco is much more consequential than it should be. Like, go ahead, <laughs> go ahead and spill, spill it out. <laughs> Before the podcast, I was saying to Gwen, this is, this is a very spicy take. Um, but I do, so, you know, what I said in my tweet is, is really, is really accurate. So uh, first off, Michelle Wu's Corruption of Copyright, which just came out, is an excellent piece. And it, it really frames the way in which copyright has changed, particularly over the last 20, 30 years, uh, as being used more as a cudgel than a tool. And talk, it talks really in a super fascinating way about how even the framers of the Constitution saw the public interest and saw the public good value of copyright. They did not uh, think necessarily that the situation we're in now is a situation we would be in and should be in. And so, you know, I, when when you think about this, in the past, you know, I could say, well, you know, Prince's record label is treating him poorly. Maybe Prince, because of his history with copyright, is not a great example. But OK, so Prince's uh, label is treating him poorly. I support Prince. I'm going to step away from buying any records from his distributors. And I would still have, you know, an enormous catalog that I could choose from. Now here, you know, here we are, I am a Spotify user. I've been a Spotify user for years. You know, it's a great service and I know that it's bad for author for, sorry, I know that it's bad for musicians. I know that it's bad for many of my friends who found their material on Spotify and are seeing pennies on the dollar. You know, it's the same exploitation of artists that has existed throughout time. But now, instead of being able to say, well, I'm going to take, you know, my dollars and spend them uh, for materials, uh, you know, I'm sorry, I'm going to take my dollars and I'm going to go to a different record label. I'm like, I could use Apple Music and then I'm even further locked into the <laughs> Apple, uh, you know, ecosystem. Like, no, thank you. Plus, like all of my information is is in Spotify now. It knows what I like to listen to. And I, you know, have found it really useful over the years. And, you know, not to just sort of switch over to talk about libraries, like, you know, the only way to get Spotify in a consumer based system, like the one that we live in, is to um uh is to pay for it. And so, you know, libraries purchase things that is what they do. They buy lots and lots of materials, but they're, they're not buying Spotify exclusive. So that means that there's an enormous amount of material that is not available to the public in the same way that it has been in the past. You know, in the past, a record company would not withhold significant pieces of its catalog from the public that would be made available under a public, under, um, a lending right under first sale in the US or under a public lending right in other countries. And so I think that's a really unique situation and not one that's that's frequently considered like 
Obviously, I don't listen to, I don't want to say obviously, I don't listen to Joe Rogan. <laughs> many, you know, many millions of people do. And it's listened to at a scale that I think is kind of incomprehensible. But I should be able to to do more than just say, well, Spotify, please don't do this because I'm locked into your system. You know, we sh- you can't even boycott um, a company when they're engaged in bad practices because there aren't choices. Um, I have a, fr- I have a good friend, this is anecdotal, but I have a good friend who still has an iPod. And when this habit, you know, with all of her music lo- loaded onto it, that she's purchased and then keeps on her iPod. And when this happened, you know, she said, she sent me a text and said, I told you so, you know, <laughs> like, um, you know, at the end of when, you know, all of these companies fold, she will still have her music and I won't, um, you know, I, I don't think that it can be considered definite that Spotify will never go away that I, and then I won't lose access to all of my music. And I think that's a consideration that, um, you know, that just isn't considered enough. Libraries are forever. They have long, long, long memories. Spotify doesn't, it's only been around, you know, for 10 years, it's venture capital backed. Like who knows if it'll be around in 10 years and who knows, you know, what will come to replace it. Hashtag end of rent. <laughs> thank end, you what? For, end of rent. Hashtag end of rent. <laughs> end, end of rent. No, so thank you very much. Public. <laughs> it's very, very useful insight. Um, Libraries everywhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, well, a question I ask every guest on this on this uh, podcast is um, because this interview series, it's called World Culture. And uh, of course, yeah, for obvious reasons. But um, we, we ask our interviewees, like, when did you hit that wall for the first time? And so what made you realize for the first time, like, okay, something is wrong here, something, something is rotten in the copyright system? Yeah. So my origin story is pretty personal, but it's one that I, I tell and one that I, I feel comfortable telling because I do think it's really important. Mm -hmm. So uh, about three years ago, my mother passed away of a rare genetic autoimmune disorder and she was sick with it for many, many years. And it is rare enough that there isn't a lot of research about it that is not behind a paywall. And so in graduate school back in 2012, I was working as a cataloger as in a medical library. Uh, they had recently gotten a large shipment of German language medical books from the 19th century. And because I read German, I was sort of working through this collection, but also because cataloging is the, well, in my opinion, one of the more, um, one of the slower jobs that one can do in a library. <laughs> Um, I had plenty of time uh, to uh, do research. And I was lucky enough to be at University of North Carolina, which has really incredible medical research resources. It has a, a truly amazing uh, medical library. And so I, get, I got access to materials about this disease, which has been known about and studied for, for hundreds of years that I had never had before, things like up-to-date um which has readable, um, informative information about something that could potentially affect me within my lifetime and, and did affect my family and affected my mother. And so I, you know, I, I was able to read from books that I had not had access to. And then when I left the library, I lost all of that. I, I don't have access even now to information on my mother's disease. So, you know, this is pretty heavy, but, you know, when she was in the hospital and she was hospitalized a lot in her last few years, when she was in the hospital, doctors would ask me things and I had no way of, of knowing because I didn't know what the progression really looked like because I didn't have access to medical materials that I should have had access to. So for me, you know, like, why are those kept locked away? Why does up to date cost millions of dollars a year for libraries and for hospitals when it's readable, accessible medical content? Why is that information which is produced for free or for low cost by physicians locked away? 
Why is the research that is funded by the federal government locked away um, from the people who can really use it and can make better informed decisions about their care and about their lives? And granted, like, you know, a lot of it is over my head, right? I'm not a physician, but, um, you know, even just simply having access to it um, and having access in it in a way that... um, is findable and usable, mm-hmm. that's that's crucial for me. And that's why I do this work. And, you know, that's <laughs> that's why I care so much about it is because it's, you know, for me, it's not only about, um, you know, you know, can I get the new Dean Kunst book? Mm-hmm. I don't read Dean Kunst, maybe choose a better example. Uh, can I get the new um, Margaret Atwood book uh, from the library? Um for me, it's also about, you know, can I make informed decisions and can I, um, I you know, can, how, how can I actually create a better world for people who need information? And like, I'm also, uh, you know, I also want to add one corollary is like, you know, I am a, a white North American with a college education. And for, if for me, the access question is so limited. I really want to make sure that I address the fact that for many, many other people mm-hmm. around the world, most people around the world, what I am describing is the norm and not the exception. Thanks. Thanks for the, for sharing this and thanks for this insight and for pointing again, at least, uh, that we shouldn't uh, only look at this from uh, from our Western or Northern American or Western European glasses. Um, mm-hmm. We try to address this issue uh, elsewhere on this uh, on this podcast as well uh, to try to look to look at it through different glasses. Um, mm-hmm. So we t- we're talking. I mean, I'm almost at my closing question actually already. So it's been a time flies by. Um, but um, we, so we're discussing about copyright le- legislation issues um, uh, in the US, but also worldwide. And and, and I, I think it comes down also to its failure to adapt to the digital era. Um, so my, my closing question is actually like, how, in your opinion, can we make this all work in an online and connected world? You've already touched some some of this, of course, in, in your replies to previous questions. What what are the key things that need to change and how can we make this happen? And what should 2030 look like, in your opinion? So I'm going to quote Leela Bailey of the Internet Archive here and say that we want the Internet to look more like a library, right? We want um, you know what I what I what I think of as almost like a rights agnostic internet that you know respects copyright, but also provides the greatest amount of access to the greatest amount of people in a way that is comprehensible to them. And so, what that looks like for me, and I I and for Library Futures more generally is promoting legislation, promoting advocacy on one side, and also working with technology on the other in order to, you know, bring these values that libraries in the public sector and public interest technology bring to the copyright debate in, you know, a digital first, digital rights forward context. So, you know, for all of the sort of hand waving about creators, at the end of the day, libraries care about creators. The public interest cares about creators, and um, I do think it's a little bit of a straw man because also at the end of the day, the people setting those contracts, the people creating those um, kinds of um, uh situations that really disempower writers and the public and, you know, other kinds of creators, that's publishers. That's not libraries. Uh, That's not um, even necessarily technology companies all the time. And I know that's kind of a controversial thing to say, but it's, uh, it's really important to consider, you know, keeping a really positive, um, keeping a, keeping a very positive, 
policy agenda and ensuring that we're thinking about the world that we want to actually create. That's why I like this question. And not just about being reactive all the time to the latest abuse by uh, the entrenched rights holders of the world, by the big, the frankly, the big corporations, right? Like this is, you know, um, a question of the big guy, the big, the big publishers, the big media companies um, against the public. So, you know, what I would like to see in 2030 is an internet that enshrines values of privacy, that enshrines values of equality and, and equity, um, and that provides high level, like large amounts of good information to the widest variety of, of people. And also that uh, addresses issues of climate and issues of ecology and, um, and networks and, you know, really re-empowers or empowers for the first time people to take control of their digital futures, of, you know, what they um, uh, want to learn about rather than, you know, being used as sort of this tool of mass media, unlike anything we've ever seen before. So I think um, at the end of the day, I come from the sort of optimistic abundance of the commons it's my uh, way of addressing the world and my way of, of seeing the world and thinking about the world. And I do want to think about this from an abundance mindset. I mean, think about how much incredible material is out there, how much incredible um, art and learning and things that we can do together to really empower people rather than um, thinking about it in a, in a fully reactive space. So, you know, keeping abundance rather than scarcity, making the library look more, sorry, making the internet look more like a library and uh, enshrining library values into into copyright in the web. Uh, copyright is, uh, is important, even though I think it's a little, uh, maybe a little out of fashion right now, um, but it is something that we all have to live with um, and it's ours to change it. Thanks. I, mean, I consider myself the worst, the world's worst librarian, but I can get the. I, can get the, I, I was even. I was very bad at cataloging. Um, okay. Oh my gosh! No, I was. I like. I, I really like to. Um, I really like documentation. So I was supposed to be cataloging, but instead I just made like a like twenty page document about how to catalog. So it's not. It, it was. A, Short-lived job. <laughs> well, thank you for this for these insights. Is there anything else you would like to share with uh, with our audience before uh, we close this? Yeah, well, one thing actually that I was thinking about this, which which we haven't really touched on, and I don't want to take up too much more time, but one other thing that I sort of alluded to in my last answer that I that I think is important to consider, and I, I think we see this within the ebooks laws in the United States in particular, is that libraries are, are sort of treated as exceptional when it comes to market forces, and they are, right? So Kyle Courtney, our board chair, wrote a post about library superpowers and sort of the special things that they can do under copyright, and I, I think that's very, very true. But at the end of the day, when it comes to questions of lending, libraries are consumers. They do not set author contract prices. They do not, um, uh, you know, make they don't they don't do anything different besides lend books. And um, I think it's really important to consider that because once you start to understand that, like the contracts that libraries are sell are are signing with vendors in many cases are are broken then i think it really opens up um a, a truly different way to think about the ways in which they interact in the market like you know if you if you, you in the sorry and the ways that it limits consumer choice so that's that's something that I really want to make clear is that libraries are definitely special, but ultimately they are buying materials and lending them. And this sort of cause of and this um, commitment to getting the greatest amount of public access is the, is the most important goal. 
But that doesn't necessarily mean that now, just because we've switched to a different format, they should be treated differently. Like libraries have always bought books. You know, why now with the rise of digital, should it be that the in the entire state of Rhode Island, you can't get a copy of Charlotte's Web? That would be unheard of in a physical environment. And so I do want to make it clear that like when we're thinking about the ebook spills, we're thinking about this as a consumer protection issue. And we have an unprecedented chance to transform consumer protection in the, fa- in the favor of the public good. And I really hope and ha- we have been working to make that a reality. This podcast was produced by HeartCast Media.